All right, welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about some advanced selectors, so it's important to know that there really are some additional fun things that have been added lately uh, to even CSS selectors. Most of the fun is in CSS rules and CSS properties, but there's some fun things with CSS selectors that have been added fairly recently uh, to, to web development, and we're just going to go through some of them. So the first one is pretty easy, and it's actually really, really useful, um, and that's that you can add a selector on an attribute now as well. So it's not just tag, ID, class. Uh, you can also use all the attributes that are on there. The syntax for this is that you add brackets. Um, then there are a couple different ways to do it. Uh, this link right here is a great link if you want to go get all the details. Um, but the way that most people use it, so you see this example a lot on inputs, right? So if you have an input element uh, where the type is equal to button, so this would match just the first one, um, then you could put some rules on him. This is actually two rules smashed together. So one is a tag rule and then the other is an attribute rule smashed together. You do see them like this a lot, but, but you don't have to have them like this. In fact, this one's totally valid. Uh, so this is an attribute rule where we're just looking for anybody that has a type attribute. Um, so this one would actually match both the first one and the second one because they both have uh, a type attribute. Uh, and people use them for all kinds of things. So here it, it's being used as a uh, uh, for an image. Uh, there's some examples on the next slide as well. And it's just kind of neat to, to look through at these things and look at some of the things you can do with uh, attribute selectors. So this says all input should be blue. So you can see that that hit that guy, that hit that guy. And then it says if you're an input and you're a button, then you should be red. Um, and so you can see that that affected this guy. They have the same specificity and that's because I believe that the attributes don't count at all in the specificity scoring. So they actually have the same rule. They're both one, right? And the second one, one. Um, I'd have to check on that. But, but the attributes, I believe, don't count in the specificity. Uh, and then other things here, I can see that I'm looking for something with the value US, uh, CN, or IE. And they're going to have the colors blue, uh, green, and magenta. There's some cool things there. Uh, also, this example, I showed you some of the advanced stuff you can do. So this character means begins with. So I'm looking for any source um, on anything that begins with Rolls Holman, and I'm going to put a yellow box around it. Um, and you can see that this source image must have been somewhere served by Rolls Holman. Uh, so that's what got that. And so that caret is a really advanced one. So the attribute selector, very, very handy. For some reason, I use it mainly with inputs. That's what the example is that I made here. You can go play with these, by the way. You've got it in that, uh, that GitHub repository if you wanted to go find this and play with it. Another one that's really important uh, is called a pseudo class. Uh, this one does count as 10 on the specificity scoring. And what a pseudo class is all about is it's for something that's kind of outside of the DOM tree, right? So it's not, it's not something you could necessarily just see on a DOM tree, but it is something that you, you know about the page. The way these work is you put a colon uh, in front of it. So classes had dot, IDs had number sign. These get a colon, no big deal. Uh, some of the most popular ones, the most popular one is hover. So this is only useful for desktops, of course. iPhones don't, don't really have much there. Uh, but if you're hovering over something, it will get the pseudo class hover, and you can actually make rules that change like the color or something when hover. There's also a similar one for active, so if, like you're um, typing in an input box, it'll become active. There's also things for like first child and last child, so just quick ways to make something different if it's the first one or, or not. And you can actually do nth child, so you can pick any child you want. Again, there's a really nice uh, bit of information here from the standard. Uh, W3 makes all these standards. It's a, it's a collection of companies primarily uh, who decide what the standard should be. And this is when they were talking about pseudo classes. Uh, this one got approved. And so you can see all the different things that you can do with pseudo classes. It's more fun to look at examples, though. So let's just kind of look at some examples here. So I've made a completely arbitrary uh, table um, with uh, 12 rows in it. Each row has exactly one cell, um, and it just has a really simple uh, name inside of it as well. So let's look at some of the rules we've got here. So we've got a pseudo class for nth child, and it says uh, that the third one should be blue. Uh, sure enough, uh, the third one is blue. Might be surprised that it's one-based. Kind of didn't expect that, did you? Um, and then there's also a rule here uh, for nth child for even. So all the even ones are gray. Um, and you can see that some of them aren't gray in this image. 
and that's because they had conflicting rules with somebody later. Uh, but you can at least see a couple of them are gray, right? And then you can do crazy formulas. So every um, 5n plus 2, so that's actually going to be, so if, if n was 0, it would be 2. So that one is orange. And then the seventh one is orange. And then the twelfth one is orange. Uh, so you can see that that orange rule applied to, uh, to those guys. Um, if you're hovering, hovering you can really only see a live page. I guess I could go ahead and load up the live page. And I can actually do that from my GitHub repo. I've got this pseudo classes one. Uh, and I can say open with system editor. And so hover, what it does is if I'm over one of these guys, uh, it will it will hover in yellow. Because this, this is low in the page, you can see I can go over all of them and it'll do it, except for the first one, uh, which stays red. And I just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, and the reason it stays red is because there's a, a rule for first child, uh, which is later than makes it red. So in this example, they can all go yellow except for the first child. Um, and so that's just kind of interesting. Another way to kind of learn this is to think about questions that I might ask on like an exam or things like this. But uh, first little concept question is, what would happen if, instead of on this very last one, if I said instead of the TR that's a first child, what would happen if I changed it to TD? Um, and I can just go do it, right? So if I open this up with the, the code, if I switch it from TR to TD, um, you know, pause the video, think about what's going to happen. So now it's going to go through every TD that's a first child is going to become red, and that's a high priority rule. Uh, I think this is going to be trouble. Um, so I try it, and they just all turn red. And that's because if you think about it, <clears throat> this TD, um, if you were to draw the tree, it is the first child of the TR. In fact, they're all first children. Um, and if you think about the way the tables are painted, there's like the table, uh, there's the T body, there's the row, and then there's the cell. The cell is above the other things. And so um, they actually are colors uh, underneath. Um, but if the top of it is red, then you don't care what the row is because the cell is red, right? All right, another concept question. What would happen if you just got rid of it um, and you just said any first child um, has a border of yellow? Uh, then what's going to happen? Let's go ahead and do it. So I have to get rid of this. And then instead of background red, I'm going to say border, four uh, pixels wide, uh, solid, and yellow. So now if I come refresh this page, um, so now you can see that an interesting thing happens. It doesn't look for TRs or TDs. It just looks for everybody, and it puts a border around them. So even the heading uh, got a, a yellow border around it. The hover all still works and things like that. And this is, uh, I really just wanted to point out the fact that it's not conflicting with anybody else. It's just looking for anybody that's a first child, uh, and it's making them yellow. So there's some kind of neat things you can do there. Uh, let's also mention a couple other things. Pseudo elements is the last one I wanted to mention. Pseudo elements is a way to reference something that doesn't exist. Um, they use a colon colon. You sometimes see them used in things like an article uh, where they want like the first line or the first letter to be something different. Uh, the other thing they get used for a lot is these before and after. So if you wanted to like add an image or like an icon or something like after a word, um, there's no element there to affect, um, but you could actually use these pseudo elements to make a new element before or after. So there's some crazy things with pseudo elements. The other thing I'll say is that most browsers, um, since there actually is no conflict between pseudo elements and pseudo classes, they will let you type a single colon. Uh, but just for my sanity, always use two colons, right? Um, just because that, that makes it a pseudo element instead of a pseudo class. It will work with one, one colon. But don't do it that way. Let's look at some examples. Uh, so here we've got uh, all paragraphs, um, and then we're going to make a pseudo element for the first letter. We want it to be red and big, so you can see there's a big red letter. Um, here we've got a pseudo element for first line. We want the first line to be blue, and you can see that there would be no way to do that without the pseudo element because as they move their browser width, the first line changes, right? Um, and so it's a way you can do some crazy things you couldn't have done before. And then the most valuable one is the before and after. And this is, let's say after each paragraph, uh, I wanted to add some content. And what I wanted to add was I wanted to add an image. So this is crazy. You can just make new elements in CSS. So it wasn't in the HTML at all. Um, so you just made a new element 
uh, and you added an image. Uh, we'll see an example of that as well. I'd say the most common places, if you want to add like one of those drop down arrows to tell people what to do, um, it's really good for things like that. So these are some of the crazy advanced things that you can do. It kind of got crazier as we went um, to get some advanced selectors. The best way to learn things though is to go do some exercises. Uh, I don't need to don't need to walk you through this time. Um, so go uh, follow this link. Uh, go work some exercises. If you get stuck, you can look at the solutions. But this will take you through some of the different advanced selectors. Uh, so by the time you finish that exercise, uh, you should really be kind of a a CSS selector guru. You're not necessarily a CS guru yet, uh, but you're definitely a CSS selector guru. Um, and you should really be able to, to grab almost any element on the page um, and understand why some rules defeat others. All right, that's it for the, uh, the CSS selectors unit. Uh, go knock out that uh, advanced selector exercises. Uh, make sure you get it submitted, assuming you're taking this for a grade. I will see you next time.